Let's let's uh let's do Air Bud as our first movie, please. Oh, Definitely. My God, please. We can't. We can't. He, that red rocket will make so many appearances <laughs> in our episode. Easily, that was easily the 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 hardest dog on on camera ever. <laughs> <laughs> Throbbing dog on constantly. It took me a minute to figure out what the fuck you were saying. I was like, hardest dog. Oh my god, he means wiener. Oh, I was god. like, that's a that's a ghetto. I was like, that's a ghetto ass dog, man. He showed up with his nine. That's a yeah, hard he's, ass he's dog. hard. He is hard. He's hard that way and also <laughs> little do rag and a, his nine. <laughs> Dude, he he does hoop hard as fuck though. I mean, he he's does. Straight. He does. He's he does, hard man. on the court, definitely. Wait a minute! Did Airbud get it wrong? Was he was Airbud was he gangster the whole fucking time? I think we it was the know? whole time, the whole time. I, I think Dude, we just never realized that they they got that they got that beautiful golden retriever out of like the back of one of the neighborhoods I live in, like chained to like a radiator his whole life. And then they whitewashed him just like they did with Akira. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They yeah. Hollywood these motherfuckers. They did. They Hollywooded all of it. Yeah. Yeah. They made that dog very white. And the dog was golden, but they made it white. Are we still talking about Airbud? I feel like we diverged. We're still talking. We are still talking, talking about, about Airbud. Air we yeah. have made Airbud into a cultural movement of whitewashing. I think is, mm-hmm. is where we got to mm-hmm. after talking about his dick. So, mm-hmm. not since Forrest Gump has there been a more dangerous film. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we have an episode, gentlemen? Yeah, I yeah. Think so. yeah. I think we did. We did a good enough job giving a fictional history of Airbud. Yeah. yeah, so that's mm-hmm. that's part one of this episode. As we say, though, we can fix it in post. We can, we can fix, fix it, it in post. post. Yeah, we'll just fix it in post. Yeah. It'll be fine. So uh, I heard that KY has a sick, nasty story for us, dude. Tell us about it. It's a KY night. Everyone's about to get so fucking slick. We're just going to be We <laughs> lit. It's <laughs> lit. We lit. Slick. We lit. We're just going to be rubbing and slipping and sliding, baby. Baste me in that KY jelly. Welcome to the Lesser Known People podcast. I will be your host for this evening. I will be doing the uh, the yarn spinning, and I am joined by three of my brothers. Uh, I will say up top, we are missing Connor the Beautiful. He is he is out tonight. He had a conflict, uh, mainly that he had much better things to do. <laughs> we were we're down on the list. We're just down on that list for him. So he's a busy he's, guy, and he was guy. honestly he 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 did show up. We saw him. We talked to him. He's looking so gorgeous. He's oh, so he gets true. more handsome with age. Dude, his Flawless. hair his hair was rocking tonight. Perfection. That was perfection. The facial hair was perfection. He's he's like an Irish Superman. Mm-hmm. That's exactly much an Irish Superman, yeah. Yeah. Maybe Superman is just Irish. He's just mad the whole time. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so uh we're at, we're out counter tonight, but we are joined by my three other friends. My best friends in the whole world. Don't tell my wife, because you guys are number one, two, and three. Yay. You're ta- all you're all tied for first. Mm-hmm. Connor Even also better. is tied for mm-hmm. first. Even better. So, uh, first and foremost, we have Mr. Justin, the most rabid consumer and contributor to the deeply sexual Paul Blart Mall Cop fanfic. How you doing tonight? Dude, I, wa- I, I fucking read so much Paul Blart fanfic this evening <laughs> that I masturbated myself into a coma thinking about Kevin James having sex with his Segway in that movie. <laughs> it's rub very nipples, erotic. Rub the nipples hot right now. Wow. And and that's pretty much my warm up to every every podcast that we do. So anytime you hear my voice, you knew I just fucking masturbated Kevin James having sex with a Segway. Also tonight, I got Mister Sean Hewn from one solid block of THC. How are you doing tonight, baby? It was it was not very well put together, half baked, if you will. Ha- that's right. You know it uh, it is. They are soft, but hewn nonetheless. Uh, I think for our listeners, I will mention right now. I I was gonna say a Nigel Thornberry joke because Sean is rocking the deepest, dirtiest fucking. Is that a handlebar? Maybe mustache? it's it's sincerely one of the best mustaches you will see in your lifetime. Baby, Ooh. she's clean. Ooh, stop it! It's mm. too hot for the camera. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. It is. It's it's a strawberry esque, a little a little duller than strawberry, but it is thick and dirty, baby. If dude, look up Nigel Thornberry because that mustache is on point. Yeah, this is this is very much borderline. Um, uh, the mascot from the Cincinnati Reds meets a Civil War uh veteran meets a porn star. It's beautiful right now. That's perfect. Yeah. I was going to try an accent, and now I'm just filled with too many thoughts. I don't know which way to go. 
There's a lot there. I didn't understand the mascot thing, but all the other stuff I think I got. No, no, I've, I've seen up, some. Look them uh, up. You know, well, especially if you go looking up a lot of male cheerleaders, you'll find some mustaches out there. Oh, definitely, yeah. Male cheerleaders, big mustache mm-hmm. culture there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Big mustache culture there. Well, how are you tonight, Sean, my, my beautiful friend? Oh, I'm doing quite well. Doing quite well, you know. Always just going to keep that hewn, solid, soft, mushy block of THC together so that the whole group can know. If you want to join, I'm here. If not, I'll just hold strong. God, that's so nice. Look at that. Just support either way. That's what Sean mm. brings to the mm. table. Mm. <laughs> we also have... <laughs> Yeah, everyone's uh, everyone's whipping out the gummies now. Oh my mm-hmm. god! Oh yeah, <laughs> I just baby. took one. I just took one. It's gonna get weird. Yeah, oh baby. My god, Justin's gonna get weird. This episode's already already falling apart. <laughs> we also also tonight our last and most cherished member is Mr. Big Cat, the founder and sole member of a devil worshipping sex cult. Absolutely, <laughs> I am, because that's what I wanted to start instead of a podcast, and here I we know. are. And here we are. I will just say this. My cult is up to at least, at least uh, five members, most oh, okay. of which have um, .gov emails. So I actually don't know if I'm mm. being monitored or not. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. No way. Um, nah. Interesting. But, uh, but um, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. They're into the same kinky shit I'm into. And, um, <laughs> it just shows you're gaining influence. It just honestly, it does. It does. It shows I'm gaining a, I'm gaining a following. So I look forward to when they come over tomorrow. It's scheduled. So oh, yeah, wow. good, good. They'll come over tomorrow, day of the yeah. Sabbath. It's gonna be some Sabbath. I was, I was gonna say, day yeah, of the Sabbath. Sabbath sex, really mm-hmm. good sex. Sabbath, Sabbath sex yeah. is the best. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Well, do you guys want to hear a fucking interesting, very, very cool guy? I I think is gonna be very grim, and he's. I mean, I I couldn't. I had to stop writing notes at like four pages because it was too much, and I was like. Fucking hell. And I know a KY episode is always full of way too many details. Everyone already knows KY is the host. They're already going to go to the bathroom right now so they can come back. It's, get the full no, showing. no, we're just going to you know lighten I mean? up those dirty bones and uh, make them mm. dance around in a nice jig, even though they're going to be screaming sadness and, you know. Th- they will be screaming sadness. KY, good beer looks good, man. And I always love your stories. Yeah, you do. You have top drawer stories. This is why you guys listen to this podcast, okay? Certainly check us out anywhere you can find podcasts. Also hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, the Twitter. We definitely didn't. Definitely didn't. No way. We definitely we'll come find not. you. We'll come find you. You can def- And you can also join my cult through that Twitter handle. You got so. a twat at us. <laughs> at LKP Podcast. Come find yeah. us. And check out all the KY episodes. <laughs> uh, well, tonight, guys, we... All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the opposite of what I usually do. I'm gonna give you a sexy intro for the first time. Usually, I just say the name and then do a fucking gross bio. Yeah, quick, sex right? it up. So, so, I'm gonna get it sexy. I feel like this guy is he is. I, I'm actually really pissed off. I didn't do him for the Halloween, but anyway, this guy's gonna be great. So, this man is responsible for over 400 murders. Oof. As I as the as I coined the phrase, bodies on his jacket. Oh, means nothing. sick. This guy's got 400 bodies on his jacket. He got bodies 400 on bodies jacket. on the jacket, all right? That number could actually be as high as 600. Holy shit. Wow. The government and law officers know that he did it. Yet he's never been arrested. Holy shit. In Ooh. fact, they asked him to do it. What? Now. Oh, my God. He, no way. No. He's, a, he's a government assassin. No, he is... Well, I guess kind of. Actually, kind of. He is Albert Pierre Point, and he was the English hangman for the British government for 25 years. Oh, Whoa. my God. Wow. What a fucking job that must. How do you apply for that job? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. So we got it. We're going to get into it. Uh. Yeah. So we're, deep uh, we're, deep, we're already deep in him. So I'm going to say that. So it, it's Pierre Point. Pretty sure that's how you say it. I'm going to call him Albert the whole time because Pierre Point is annoying to say. But Okay. Albert. All right. Albert. So, Mr. Albert, born in 1905 in Yorkshire, England. Yorkshire, England. Uh, Albert, all intents and purposes, has a very normal childhood. Not a weird dark guy. Not lighting fires. Not pissing his bed till he's fucking 15. None of that stuff. He's not torturing cats. Not hanging that's dogs. That's what I would assume. That's what, yeah. That would be the next step. 
it's a dark job. Ryan's been there a lot. That's what mm-hmm. he did a lot. And we lot had to refocus the effort. Had to refocus. Yeah. Had to refocus. Killing children. That's when I got into uh, pyramid schemes. I'm sorry. They're not called pyramid schemes. That's when I got into multi-level marketing. Right. 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 Being, right. A, being right. an Herbalife representative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Albert, uh, in his area, worked normal jobs. He, you know, in, he went to school for a while. Uh, again, 1905, pretty early. It's early 1900s, but um, he worked as a clog maker, as a young man, kid, young clog man, teenager, maker. a mill carrier. He was a butcher's apprentice, which could be a little bit of an inkling, but it also really wasn't that weird at the time. Just learn to cut meat. You learn to cut up the animals. It's a beautiful thing. You just yeah. sometimes you want to see a corpse, and mm-hmm. if that was what he wanted, by God, did he get oh, it? Right. Oh yes, he did. Oh my gosh! You know, it, it it's interesting how it the the first thing that Justin said is how do you get into that? It's one of those professions that you can't imagine the scenario where you get into it. And oddly enough, for Albert, it was super easy. It was a family business. No, what? I was thinking like resume. An interview, like <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a like like a Carmacula's Bible or Carmacula's Michael thing from from uh, Rick and Morty. I'm like I just love killing old, young. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Interviews of just sorry, mate, you're not qualified for this job. You haven't killed enough. Sorry. <laughs> who have you killed in your free time? You know yeah. who you're volunteering to kill on your own time. All you have at here is all you have on here is is chap at the pub. Mm, it's not gonna count. No, no, I've got signatures. They said they saw me do it, and I didn't get paid. They're there to watch. That's what they did. Signatures. <laughs> Just share from the background. Uh, so that guy's going to jail, right? Like this. That guy's this yeah. Isn't crazy. He's going yeah. to jail. We can't. He's we cannot too. hire him as an assassin. He's killed too many people already. <laughs> he, he's already killed too many people. We need the guy with with uh, with a fresh knife. Not a lot of blood on there. Yeah, but we do want some work experience. Butcher's apprentice. Hey, hey that's pretty close. Yeah, I mean that would be. But I am curious about this this family business. How do you how does one get their family lined up in this business? So his father Henry Pierre Point was an official executioner for about ten years, starting in 1901. Mm. And the the basic process for getting put on the list is you applied to the Home Office, as it was called at the time in the UK in England, and, and you wanted to be put on the list. And then someone had to, a, a lead executioner of the day had to accept you as an apprentice. So it was an apprenticeship kind of program. And then you worked as an apprentice and then you became a lead executioner. Henry Pierpoint was an apprentice and then became a lead. And this is interesting. Let me take you through this. So his father worked for 10 years, performed about, he performed at least 100 hangings. His uncle, Thomas Pierpoint, was an executioner for 40 years, almost 40 years, and has hung nearly 300 people so together a conservative number is the family total is well over 900 people before are, him or with him with him yes with because him. he's 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 somewhere between four and six and right. the the reason that we'll, we'll get into why we can confidently say 400 but it is a very confident 400 which is scary that's right. scary that's a huge number we're talking about a hard 400 yeah. Soft six hundred. Soft six. It's okay. a soft six. And we've all been there. We've all been there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Definitely, so definitely soft their, six. Uh, their family killed nearly as many people as I did when I made that koala joke in the Kathy Williams. Uh, that's true. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. it's really the same yeah. plane when you think about it. Mm-hmm. When you think about it. it I do. Often. It's, rough, it's, it's, it's the rough. same job. It's yeah. the same job. Honestly, and, and that's why KY is recording over international waters right now. <laughs> He has not me been and, on uh, land in, me, in me and McAfee, you know, yeah. I can't I can't touch that soil, but I want to. Let's take just take a second and we'll talk about Henry's father, because honestly, he has a hilarious story. Uh, so Albert's father, Henry, he was a, he was actually a part time executioner. Like I said, it's a guest start in 1901. The reason they know the year so specifically is because they make the list and then the UK has kept the list. So he made the list in 1901 and somebody somewhere had the record of it. So and he, he would be paid per hanging. Because he was part time, it was only as the hangings went, so he got paid. So if crime was up, fucking food on the table, baby, wow. which is a very weird dynamic. He's it a part time executioner. Strange. I'm pulling overtime. I'm pulling overtime. I'm doing more hangings. This He's week, out there okay? stoking criminals in the streets. Like, come on, I bet you won't go break in there tonight. I dare you. I dare you. Go break into that shop, right? Okay. Hey. Okay. Hey, he was asking for it. Am I right? He looked at your wife. <laughs> Grab him. Grab him. 
Break his fucking <laughs> neck, huh? <laughs> Break his neck. Break that neck. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but because he was part-time, he had other part-time jobs. So, it, it to me, it was such an odd thing to learn that someone in, in 1901, even the dad, was doing it part-time. So, he would go work at, like, a mill or go work some other gig. I'd be like, oh, I can't work on Friday. I have a hanging to go to. I'll be back on Monday. Is that cool with the schedule? And his boss had to be like, I guess. I yeah, that's cool. that's cool. We got to have hangings. We got a key to a democracy. We got to have hangings. Was he like the, the same as like an army reservist? Was like, can't work today, bro. Got drill. I got drill today. Yeah, but you can't fire me for it, you know? Yeah, yeah, I get, yeah. yeah I, it would probably be, the, I'd assume it'd be the same. It's just very uh, inconsistent. It's not like, you know, the third weekend of every month. It's just, I got to go. It is. I got to go yeah. hang someone. It, as far as I can tell at the time, it wasn't, there wasn't a specific, it wasn't like, 30th day, somebody's getting fucking strung up. It yeah. was like, oh, hey, this guy could probably go. Do we got anybody on the roster? Boom. I, so I'll say now, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, people being the lead executioner or like the executioner for the UK. It, it wasn't. There was just lead executioners on a, on a list. There was apprentice and leads. And, you know, the counties or whoever would just pick who was local or who was maybe more or less the favorite or well-known or more experienced. So, oh, so they were hanging a lot more people than the story lets on. Yeah, so, it, and that's grim, incredibly grim, <laughs> but it is true. Now, I'm not saying there was like hundreds and hundreds of hangings every day and there wasn't any work. It's just that there was a short list of, of people who were able to do the job. So it's just the way they make it seem in some, uh, some of the media that's come out about this guy and a few other executioners in the past in the UK, they make it seem like there's like one guy doing them all, and that's not quite true. But yeah, so back to Henry. So he was doing as kind of a side gig, doing stuff in between. So the best I could find for reference, and I'll tell you now, listeners, if, if you find a better reference, I would love to have it because it was really hard for me to find something about how much they got paid per hanging because I was like, wait a second, like how much is he, if he's doing a part-time, clearly there's a wage. So how much is it a body? How many, how many dollars does he get per body on the jacket? And if you can <laughs> give us a shout out once again on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or on our website, lessonownpeople.com. Hit us up. L let me know. Always, always happy to have constructive stuff come our way. So what I could find is um, I found a reference for a different executioner who was uh, a couple years before, and it was 1897. But this guy got paid. Uh, I'm trying to get it right. He got paid one guinea per hanging. Now, mm. I'll do conversions for the American folks. So a guinea is worth one pound, one shilling, which is the same as like 1.05 pounds. So it's like, you know, for us, it'd be a dollar and a nickel, right? Got it. Um, in modern money, that had the same buying power as about 120 bucks, 120 pounds. Baby. Okay, so that was that was a good, it was a good scratch. At least it was a decent. Bit. Human right. lives at 120 bucks. Especially as like a side gig. Breaking necks, cash and checks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that ruined my joke. Okay. Dude, Connor, Connor, I'll, I'll tell you, I know we're missing Connor, but Connor, when you listen to this, title the episode... Breaking necks and cash and checks. Please do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so early in the 1900s, Henry and Albert, who, you know, they were getting paid around this amount. Now, I think the more notoriety you got, maybe you got paid more. Again, it was kind of inconsistent, but 120 bucks. Now, Henry, Albert's father, uh, and Albert is our main guy, but, you know, Henry worked for 10 years and he only did 100 hangings. So, you know, hmm. he did, it was, he wasn't so. I hate to say prolific, but he wasn't such a busy guy that he made a ton of money off of this, even though you could make a decent wage on it. It's almost one hanging a month. Right. And so imagine having, like, you go for a Saturday or whatever, and you make 120 bucks on a Saturday. That's not a bad Saturday, but right. it's not enough to be your full-time gig, right? Yeah. So you've yeah. got to do other stuff. That's a, that's a cell phone payment back there in 1901. <laughs> this, is really, this is really the model that Uber works off of now. They went from, they went from hangings to car driving. Yeah. Yeah, I think they did. Uh, they did uh, yeah, Silicon Valley. They yeah. always say, "Remember how the the executioners in the UK did how, it?" That's yeah, what we the freelan do. freelance <laughs> executioners. That's how they worked. Let's just do that yeah. for cars. Yeah. Now let me just keep this sound in. Oh, Woo! Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, Someone's oh, cracking That's a beer. It. Put it in your mouth, KY. Oh yeah. Oh okay. god. Mm. Well, that got dark. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so mm. uh, so yeah, he's making 120 bucks per drop, uh, as it were. Um, <laughs> So this, honestly, this is why I included Henry uh, as, as a side, a little side quest in the beginning here. So Henry was removed from the executioner list, uh, to quote fingers, in 1910 
uh, not by his own choice. So he showed up for a hanging drunk, and his assistant, or yeah, his his uh, apprentice executioner, uh, kind of called him out on it. He called him out in front of everybody. Uh, Mr. John Ellis was this guy, and um, they almost came to a physical fight on the day of somebody else's execution. They wow. literally almost got into a knockdown, drag out physical fight. I'm a little busy, bro. Let's <laughs> <Yeah>. stop. <laughs> but I, I kept thinking, like, if as, as sad as it is, if it's a you're a big day, you're terrified, you got all this shit going on, you hear two cunts arguing <laughs> like ten feet from your cell because some guy shows up drunk, this or that, and you're like, I'm sorry, can we just do this thing? Can we just yeah, get can, into can just, this day can already? You, can you kill me already? Can you kill me already? It reminds me of the James Franco situation and and. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Where he's, first time. He's like, first time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. I was like, I can't, I can't believe that. Like, clearly that's, that's, that's really weird, you know, to yeah. be like, oh, this guy shows up drunk. And anyway, so Henry kind of gets into it with his assistant, John Ellis. Um, and I looked, I looked up John Ellis and um, yeah, no, he apparently was a huge asshole to work with. So. There may be some conflicting stories that I'm sure Henry, Henry was actually kind of known as a, a bit of a drunk before this, but John Ellis after this was also known as a bit of a cunt. So it doesn't matter in the realm of things, except that two assholes probably got into it on the day of somebody's execution. Uh, anyway, so back to Albert. So his dad was in it for 10 years ish, nine years, nine years and change. Um, and so the, the timing here is interesting. So Albert became an assistant executioner under his uncle, Thomas, because he was only five years old when his dad was done. You know, he was born in 05. His dad left in 10, so there's no way he could have done it, right? So, but his uncle Thomas actually got in on the executioner's list and application and all this other stuff while his dad was still in it. So the brothers kind of made each other get into it. And then his, um, Albert's uncle was still working when he kind of came of age. Albert, again, Al I know we're talking about the same family, so it's a little confusing, but Albert's the guy, he's the main guy we're talking about. And he didn't become an assistant executioner until 1932, so he was 27 at the time. He's old. He's old to peak. Old to peak. They were still hanging people in 1932? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were hanging people through the 60s. Yeah, they didn't stop until 65? Yeah. It, for, it, like, in the world? Like, in, in England? Yeah. Well, in the world, it's, it, in the world, it's still going on. It was going on through the most recent century here. Yeah, but yeah, no, England and and certainly the U.S. was still doing. Yeah, it. I could totally imagine like the Wild West doing hangings, like what 1910, yeah. 1920, 1930 for sure. People were getting hanged. I just like in my mind, nineteen thirty two was just a, you know we we knew what electricity was. You know what I mean? I think gonna... I think we're all with you on that. Yeah, it was barbaric, but it was still a method for sure. Right, and I think that's that's also part of what was interesting about this guy to me is not only is this profession insane to me and how do you get into it and all these other questions, but the timeline of it. And as if if you're keeping track here, 1932, there's some big things coming. So he's 27 in 1932. There's a lot of shit down the road here. So, but you know, it, it's an interesting time for him to be an executioner by hanging only. Yeah. So that's what he did. And there's he's just getting his career started in 32. So it's it's kind of wild this this whole story. Um. So anyway, so his uncle he, he became an, an assistant under his uncle, uh, doing an apprenticeship. Uh, who his first one was in Dublin. As an assistant executioner, Albert had to follow the prisoner onto the scaffold, bind his legs together, and then step back off the trapdoor before all the fun happened, and the lead executioner hit the lever and dropped. That is something you don't screw up a lot. You don't really screw that up a lot. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to be the reason for delay in a in a situation like that. You know, you don't want to drop your keys right then. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my shoes untied. I'm sorry. Still on the fucking platform here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? I got rock in my shoe. Can we just stop for a second? It's like, no, this guy's going to be dead in 10 seconds. You have to just get there. He's going to be dead. On and off. On and off. We just need to break this neck again. <laughs> so I always think in these like really high, like high emotion, high stress scenarios, you know how sometimes you tend to like choke on your own spit? You used to oh, start yeah. coughing yeah, irrationally yeah. or something like that. How like how deeply embarrassing would it be for him to be like, all right, first execution. I've heard my dad talk about it a lot, but we're walking the guy out and then he like stumbles on his shoe. He's he chokes on his own spit. He he gets a coughing, sneezing fit. Like that's so it's it's like too much stress to just even be part of it. 
that to me is the severity of the situation. Again, you're doing something so inc- you are doing one of the most severe acts any human being can perform. Right. Uh, right. And it's apparently it's it's legal at this time to do these things. And obviously, there's the moral you know dilemma you have that you're struggling with at this point. So no, no question, you screw up when it's it, the tension is that high. Yeah. Now, luckily, his his first hangings as an assistant all all went pretty smoothly. Good. Those people died. They died quickly. They were done. Yeah. And it, to uh, I think um, it is worth saying that his uncle has uh, basically nary a blemish on his record, his forty year record. So he was he was top tier. He did his job well. He took it seriously, and he took Albert under his wing um, pretty right away. I just think of the guy who announces the Mortal Kombat thing of like flawless victory finish (laughs) him that's all it is in the background but he's got like his nephew under his arm like okay now we shout flawless victory flawless victory (laughs) you could do it this time you could do it this time yay fatality as the neck snaps yeah what what would be what would be a blemish woman find in the record hanging folks back then so um (laughs) i'm gonna say this till later um i'll i'll no 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 no, no, no. It, it's about it's about his uncle Thomas. So um, he got he, because he worked for forty years. He was, I think, if if uh, I'm going to do some very basic math, if he worked for forty years, he I think he would have been in his seventies. His uncle, his uncle would have been in his seventies when he kind of stopped, or he got like removed from the list in his seventies. And at near the very end, somebody called into question Thomas Pierre Point's vision, and was like, "Oh, I don't think he can see so well." And oddly enough, when you put the hood. And the noose on somebody's neck, you're real fucking close to him. And then that lever, you're touching. So, I, I, you know. It, are we going to say, like, what What the fuck do you need to see so much? Exactly, exactly. So I think, like, they can sort of, um, they can get, like, complaints against them. But it's almost internal, it seems, that you can get a blemish. Okay. Oh, wow. So there's, like, just the hierarchy of the, the fraternity of these guys themselves. It's kind not of. outside complaints. It's not like the dead guys, like, writing a fucking... Complaint yeah. from the afterlife, yeah. <laughs> or the townspeople who showed up. It was not my best show. It was not the best show. <laughs> it, it seems like Thomas was a bit drunk, and perhaps his eyesight's in question. <laughs> I have seen much better hangings. Yeah, uh, I will say I don't. I don't have the notes for this in front of me, but I tried to compare like the UK hanging numbers or execution by hanging numbers to the US execution by hanging numbers, and I, I couldn't find any firm numbers on any of them because basically we've been doing it for a long fucking time. And... <laughs> It's all it's all real grim as a human race, by the way. It's super fucking dark. What I did I did find is I think I think and please check me on this. I think in like 1936 or, or around that time, the U.S. hung their last as a capital punishment. They they hung somebody for the last time, and the crowd it was the last sorry it was the last public hanging, and the crowd was like 18,000 people showed oh up to this God. fucking thing. It was the Stones' last tour. Exactly. They fucking asses in the seats for this guy to get hung. And somebody somewhere uh, high enough in the U.S. government was like, maybe this is a bad idea to, like, feed this, like, bloodthirst so heavily. We should probably cut this shit off and be just done Just walks with up it. there, gives a thumbs down, and that's it, when they're fucking executed. Yeah, and people just fucking scream, yeah, kill him again! Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is happening? Yeah. You gotta get there early to get the good seats. You want to get close and hear the neck crack, don't you? But you gotta imagine, like that conversation probably happened, which oh, is did. fucking no weird. Question. That's, how, sure. that's how it I'm works. Sure. Yeah, somebody somewhere was like, "All right, pack the picnic bag. We're going to the fucking hanging. <laughs> it's at three. You, that's right. We're leaving at seven a.m. We have to get good seats. I want to. I want to feel his last breath on me." Small, small rant. When people say, "I wish things were as as decent as they were in olden times," God, this yeah. is a this is a clear reference. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Because we were as barbaric and savage as humanly possible back then. Boy, the so. 1930s sure were a good-ass time. We should go back to the 1930s. Dust bowls, depression. <laughs> hangings. <laughs> Legal hangings. Yeah. God, not to mention all the other horrible shit going on. Yeah, so um, so yeah, he worked as an apprentice, and it, it went well. So, you know, he was 27 at the time when he really started on his little journey here. So he actually worked, I think from his teens through his 20s, he worked at a grocery store. Um, so he had, he was like a regular dude, which is, it, it's one of the, it's the profession where like, you know, in, in pop culture or whatever you see, it's some big stupid guy. He's got the hood on. It's, you know, he's just a fucking Neanderthal, whatever. But like, 
this is just a dude. He, he's like, he was bagging groceries, delivering stuff. He actually became the manager of the grocery store. Like, had like a legit <laughs> job. And was like, I love killing people on the weekends. All right. Well, I, I do. Sometimes I do like to categorize people in like the things that they do. And like, I, I feel like it's always the same person who delivers my, my Grubhub. You know what I mean? Yeah. This, guy, this guy's eHarmony profile reads, uh, Grocer on the weekend, enjoyment, killing people. Right. Hangings. <laughs> so I, I just I just have a hard time buying that this guy didn't have any like crazy quirks before he, he's like, well, yeah, I guess I'll hang, folks. I actually think my whole impression is that he was a super regular guy whose family history just kind of like got him into this a little bit. But okay. because it was a part time gig, he was able to kind of like still just be himself. Like he was still the manager of, of the grocery store for, for a little while. Now there isn't a huge overlap there, but he, he always had side gigs. He was always kind of doing something else, but he just was, he had a good teacher and his uncle for hangings and he got on the list and then became known. And the, you know, the last name was kind of known and he just became the guy. But I mean, so, but, but there's, there's, there is still room to make fun of Henry and Thomas and just, like, Oh, maybe they're fucking weird. Oh, Oh no, no. And I, 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 I mean that fully that like, something's off if you can show up um so so his his dad was a drunk right and he he got his tutelage from his uncle well his uncle told him if you have to have i forget the quote but he's like if you have to have whiskey to do it don't do it you know i almost feel like maybe you should have the whiskey to do it yeah (laughs) if you have to have whiskey you're not big enough you're not big enough to do this job you gotta do it sober and then you can't blink the entire time those are the things It's like you're too grounded in what you're doing and it makes it weird. So Albert has said from the beginning that he he held he held that profession as like basically pretty sacred. Didn't come off as overly religious or any of that stuff. But he was like, listen, regardless of what they did, regardless of who they were and all this other stuff. It is a huge deed we're doing and we're going to do it with as much kind of respect and as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So. Everything reads that he was a pretty good dude and that he was trying to do the best he could in this job. But it's still like, dude, you didn't have a drop of alcohol. You were doing this stone sober and you're yeah. seeing boom, body drop, boom, body drop, boom. And it's like, that's got to have an effect. It's you brought really, these men does. to their death. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the psyche of this individual is something to study. Right. So, yeah. So your grocer could be hanging you in the 1930s and 40s. Welcome to the jungle. As a Marine. This guy would be welcome into. To, to, to my <laughs> oh man, group. I I would love honestly, I would love to have a beer with this guy. Can you fucking imagine? Yeah, be oh sick. <laughs> Albert went from assistant ex- executioner to lead around 1940. Uh, he was assisting in the hanging of. I want to get this right. Udam Singh, uh, who was a Punjabi man convicted of assassinating Sir Michael O'Dwyer. Now. This is a weird rabbit hole. So another part that was really cool about about doing the research for this is the people that he that he did the hangings for were all like these crazy criminals. So like we could do a whole fucking true crime on all the people he killed. You know, we could just say here's who we killed and then do the thing on because it's bananas. Like the the people. And welcome to our new podcast, Crime and Wine. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, man. It's like we do Albert Pierre points murders and just do an entire podcast all by itself um so if if you're interested i this is the only one i, I dug into i'm not going to do this with everybody we talk about but so sir michael o'dwyer was in india in the 30s i think and he was responsible for the jalan wahala ba massacre mm. okay basically british troops opened fire on about 1200 indians during a peaceful protest and killed 400 of them. You gotta love Jeez. imperialism. You know, the thing is, you gotta love imperialism. It's really wow. good. It's Co- really, it was super good. That's works. why, it, that's, yeah, it was you know really what? good. You know what? I'm not mad at them. You know why? Every time I fly to a different country, they all speak English. I'm okay with that. <laughs> oh my God. That's a cut. That's, that's a, a cut. Harsh. Yeah, that's a cut. You're cutting that one? It's <laughs> not that bad. They all speak English. They all fucking, fucking. do. Just <laughs> 
brutal, brutalized. All right, cut that one. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, so I I kind of was like, oh, because this is the first one. Honestly, it's the first one that comes up in Wikipedia. If honestly, if you want this entire story, just read it. Just read the Wikipedia page. It's all really well sourced. There's books and movies and shit out. But you know, keep keep listening to us. Keep listening to us and listen to uh, our yeah, other no. our other items Don't on go anywhere you find podcasts or listen or watch anything else. You come back here. We have the good stuff. And just so mm-hmm. you know, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram. We definitely did not forget about Twitter. Uh, and, you know, just our website, too. You could just, just go find everything, lesserknownpeople.com. We are the spot. That's right. And I, I apologize for the undersell, you know, classic undersell. Yeah, That's classic undersell. For. This is uh, low rating Kyle. You know what I mean? Classic KY. Classic KY. So <laughs> while he was assisting in the hanging of Mr. Udam Singh, which, by the way, that Sir Michael O'Dwyer guy that's responsible for that massacre deserved to get fucking killed. So, for, I, sure. I, for, yeah. sure. for sure, yeah. for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Right. So, but but by law, you know, Udam Singh, he he had to get you know found guilty and hung. So Albert was assisting a newly appointed lead uh, executioner named Stanley Cross. I don't know. At some point early during the execution, um, Cross became a little bit confused about the calculations related to the hanging about the drop and all this other stuff, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And Albert basically stepped up and not saved the day, but he he helped correct the hanging, and then the hanging went really smoothly. So that kind of showed the, I don't know, people who cared about those say, things that Albert was ready for the big show. He was ready to become lead. Well, now, and, and I just wanted to say, I'm I'm not a part of this profession, but but my mind says this is concerning the angle of the dangle. Angle of the dangle, angle of the definitely. Dangle. And that's, that's honestly, that's the mathematical okay. term they use. Okay. That is the mathematical term they use. It feels correct, you know? Albert went up there and was like, wait a second, rotate it 35. That's the angle of the dangle. Angle of the dangle. Angle of the dangle will break the neck. And that's how you cash. That's why he cashes checks. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's not the heat of the meat. It's the angle of the dangle. That's the truth. That's what guys with small penises say, and that's what I say. Well, he's also looking to turn the meat cold, uh, so he's just on a whole different, <laughs> he's on a different scheme. Guys who are about to get hanged and um, guys with small penises. Those are the two item, two two times that's referenced. Can I can I t- admit to you guys how pissed off I am? I didn't think of angle of the dangle. <laughs> Son of a bitch! <laughs> so mad! Well, this, again, this is what Sean brings. This is why we keep that. It's crazy bastard around. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, so Albert makes the jump. He becomes a lead. He becomes a head dick in charge. Now, I bet you're asking yourself, listeners and my beautiful brothers, what does a lead executioner do? Assistant. I am. Wondering. I am. You're wonder- Justin's wondering. We're all wondering. Why don't I just tell Please. you? Please. So we talked about we talked about what the assistant does. He ties the legs and all this other stuff. The lead and the assistant arrive typically the night before the execution. They are given the height and weight of the prisoner. And they also, so I, I, I'm not gonna say I love this, but there's always like, uh, there's always like terminology and jargon in professions, and so they look at the prisoner through the condemned, or they look at the prisoner in the condemned cell, and condemned cells in quotation marks, and they look at him through the Judas hole, also in quotation marks. I don't know. I'm not gonna make a glory hole comment, and I wish you wouldn't either. Well, now that it's out there, I mean, let's you talk dropped about it. it hot. God damn it! You can always go full Porky's on a Judas hole. That's no true. question. That's I true. mean, it's it's a it, that's a that man's last night on earth. He might be willing to suck a dick for once. You no, know but I mean? it's the opposite. It's I just, the opposite I just of a say, glory hole. I just want to say, every sincerely dark uh, director that's out in Hollywood right now, just listen to this podcast, Take baby, because you got your next fucking film right here yeah we're talking to you harvey weinstein it's probably right up your alley <laughs> we're gonna call it the judas hole the judas hole yeah, or we can do it we can do a tarantino film and just do the whole thing backwards for some reason i can see i can absolutely also see this being the next uh terrence malick film where it's uh awkward uh multi-narrated film like he's done previously i could see I've, that. And all the honestly you guys have announced so many directors I feel like I'm like, wow, I don't know any directors anymore. Go or, watch a fucking all. movie. Damn. I haven't. I don't read the credits. I can, I'm bad at literacy. <laughs> Very early I've said it. I don't read the credits. <laughs> Even the opening ones, I just shut my eyes. Just <laughs> I want to see it. I don't want to see the words. <laughs> <laughs> 
bringing it back. Reel it in. Bringing it back. Bring it back. Bring it so back. So we're going to move on past the Judas hole real quick. So they, they get a look at the guy. They get the height and the weight. Then they go to the execution room. And this is what blows my mind. The condemned cell and the execution room are usually right next door to each other. Keep that in mind as I describe what happens next. Got it. They inspect and test the equipment the night before using a large sack about the weight of the guy. So you're in your condemned cell, and through your fucking wall, you can hear two assholes playing around with a sack being like, no, he's 80 kilos. Oh, no, he said he was 88 kilos. Oh, no, that guy can't rap. Oh, yeah, that's ever. And they're dropping and I just, it. I just want to make sure that our listeners, Alejandro Gonzalez and Arito, heard that future director uh, of this, this film we're just describing right now. Did you just shoehorn another director? Name? I just <laughs> did, yeah. Another this director. Thing? yeah. You did. Okay. He, yep. wedged, okay, he that. wedged that joke in there as deep Man, as you can. You stomped that in there. Well, Goodness. I stomped that in there. Absolutely. Because this is, <laughs> he would be the perfect director. <laughs> Like, sincerely perfect. Like, I'm already in my mind envisioning what he would do with this film. Anyways, continue. <laughs> anyway, so if, you're, so if you're waiting in your condemned cell and you're, you're going to die tomorrow, you know it. You're held in that cell all night. And you got to listen to these couple yahoos trying to figure out the rope and shit beforehand. Now, that being said, most of the time it's very experienced people, so it shouldn't be too much of a comedy show. But there's still like a Benny Hill sort of aspect to this stuff. Yeah, da, 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 da. And they're fucking yeah, running yeah. around with a sack and they can't figure it out and the rope keeps breaking or the noose isn't tied right. Yeah, I just I thought it was such an odd dynamic. I would like to see these guys running around with just a giant like protractor the entire time, like, no, 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 you're wrong. You uh, no, 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 that's not the right angle. I've right done angle. told you. That's not the right angle. That's how you hang potatoes, that's not how you hang a human body. I can't imagine the angle should be anything other than zero or 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah, it is It is straight up and down. That's it. That's, that's, that's where you're That at. is how it works. <laughs> Depending on how you orient your, your pro tracker. I don't, mean to, I, don't mean to upset, I don't mean to upset our listeners, but we are on planet Earth, and we understand how gravity <laughs> works. We are, we are recording from planet Earth. Now, the Earth is flat, so we have that to consider. It is, it is also. I forgot about that. I was, was going to say, if you, read, if you read my blog... I picked on flat earthers a little bit. That's okay. That's okay because they don't know how to explain gravity any better than us. I, I yeah, thought the <laughs> I thought the demographic was small enough to insult and be, be okay yeah, with. Yeah, they're if oh yeah. they get angry, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. We're not worried about that one. If you're a flat yeah. earther, don't listen to this fucking podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Go we'll, fuck we'll yourself. See you somewhere Go else. find the next podcast. So we got modern va- modern day vampires and flat earthers. Don't listen to us. <laughs> Those are the two groups we need to exclude here. Are we still technically dealing with a gallows? Is that still what it's called? Or, or is there a new contraption, a new system, a platform? Like, is it mobile? It's not mobile. So basically, there were certain prisons had the setup. They had the condemned cell and they had the room next door. Now, from what I could tell, it wasn't like they were in a small cell and then the room next door was like 20 feet tall. Basically, they made it look like the same size room. But then the trap door just goes into nothing. You know what I mean? It's just empty. So the trap door just is like a hole in the floor that they can flip. Okay. I, I still, I was expecting like outdoors and crowds and people watching and yeah. shit. Now we're that, inside. That's what I thought of too. And it's just like, it's got all the grandeur stripped away. What am I even paying for? I'm paying for Angle of the Dangle. I want to see a show. I brought a picnic <laughs> basket with sandwiches. I'm getting first in line in the morning. Now you're doing it in a room. Who gets to watch this shit? Yeah, so I, I apologize. I, I don't know when the UK went fully away from public hangings, but no time during Albert's. Well, that's not fully true. We'll, we'll get into that later. But the vast majority of citizens and civilians that he hung were in the privacy of the prisons. Ah, okay. okay. That's pro- maybe is that to protect him? Is that to protect him from like the family member yes. attacking him or something? Yeah, so he, he is under, um, I forget, I, I read it once. It's, it's some sort of like privacy and... Um, disclosure indemnity sort of thing where he can't he couldn't really talk about a lot of stuff until way after the fact and that kind of stuff because he he didn't want to be he basically he didn't want to be vilified in his own community which would be tough right so he goes out he'll wear the black hood execute (laughs) well now he doesn't have to do it right so he's in the prison so him and him and his guy just show up in a in a a lorry and they pop in the night before they're doing the shit and then they do the thing and then they leave and for the you know Maybe other prisoners would probably know who, you know, where we get around, who the guy is or who the guys are. 
they do the hanging, so you'll you'll know. But beyond that, you're just you're just a dude in a room. To our U.S. listeners, everyone knows an executioner comes in from the rafters down to the wrestling ring That's yes. true. with his yep. hat on. That's true. That's true. And then um, Vince McMahon acts really scared, and then. It's just Macho Man Randy Savage. Yeah, he attacks, he attacks gym. Macho Man Randy Savage. Yeah. You, you always know the executioner's coming when the bell tolls. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. The bell tolls. Everyone looks around like, fuck, where is he? And I'd assume that's, that is dead accurate to how executions work. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they're walking the guy. It's, they're walking onto the platform, or into the room, I should say, and then the bell tolls, and then you just hear some guy out of the distance, the bell tolls for thee. And mm-hmm. then you die. Mm-hmm. And that's then right. You die. Mm-hmm. And then you die. And then he dies. Yeah. And then he dies, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> you bastards. <laughs> I told you, I have four pages of notes. Can no, you just, no. Can you, keep, can you keep in the WWE joke? Uh, no, I'll definitely keep it that wasn't. In. It wasn't amazing. That's just me begging for screen time here at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Release the big cat tapes. <laughs> hey, let's, ah! let's get those released. Let's get them out there. <laughs> uh, so I have I have two little side notes, kind of about the generic profession that I, I I thought were interesting. So one little thing is if if they if the guy was a particularly maybe heavy, which by the way they only went up to 198 pounds <laughs> in your bra. Come on, they couldn't hang anybody heavier than that. In your bra. Oh, shit. oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so there was like severe weight restrictions on this. I, get, I mean, kind of, right? Like they, they could make the adjustment, I'm sure, by just using... Um, so they had the Home Office, the UK government, uh, sponsored a table of drops, which is to calculate the amount of rope and the drop to provide the necessary snap of the rope. So if you provide too little rope, it'll be a strangulation. If you provide too much rope, literally you'll decapitate them, either within their own body and they won't die of a neck snap, or you'll decapitate them fully, as in to remove their head. Ooh. And you don't really want to do either. I could imagine degloving someone's face. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fucking brutal. And so they did, in the interest, because they had a lot of bad hangings in the past, they were like, all right, how the fuck do we do this right? I guess the magic number is something, somewhere around 1,000 pounds per square inch on the neck. And so basically, based on your weight, they'd give you so much rope to do such a drop. Um, yeah. So I, I looked up one. If somebody was 150 pounds, they got like seven feet, two inches of rope. Mm. And so you being dropped from a stand, boom, it would be just enough to snap your neck, not decapitate you, and not let you die of a strangulation, which could take minutes. Yeah. So um, they did try to do it the most humane way possible. Now, that was in place when Albert was there, when he was around. But before that, fucked. It was yeah. like basically whatever, a shit show. Whatever works, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, just, it was, I'm sure there was some really awful shit. They had it out when he was there, so he was in good shape. He had a, he had a way to do it. The other interesting part is, excuse me, they would take the sack that they used to kind of test out the equipment, make sure everything was in good order. They would then tie the sack to it overnight to make sure the rope was fully stretched. So that if, say, it was a new rope and it wasn't stretched very much, it wouldn't give all that slack at the initial hanging and then change the amount of the drop. Which right. I was like, that's actually a fucking, like, great thing for the for the person you know you want it to be clean yeah wow yeah i was like that is weirdly considerate it is yeah it's kind of like a good gesture to the dead yeah to be like listen and and and, and i said it before and i'll say it again albert had always said he's like listen it doesn't matter i'm here to do this thing let's just do this thing right it's important and from then on we just move we just move on to the next but he wanted to make sure he got it right, and so they would do that shit. Now, it wasn't just him doing that kind of thing. They all, it was kind of standard practice, but I thought it was like, that is very considerate. I'm just going to sip in here. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good stuff. So, uh, 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 one of the reasons our friend Albert's body count is so high, and so much higher, like his uncle worked for 40 years, only at 300-ish, and his dad worked for 10, only at 100 one of the reasons Albert is so high is because he was selected as the lead executioner during World War II. Got it. Oh. So yeah, of, that makes sense. Boom. A lot of like defectors, spies, shit like spies. that. Spies. Yeah. Right. Just to set everyone at ease, I'm going to give you one example, and then we'll go generic after that. But this one is fucking crazy. So this is the first um, non-civilian hanging that he did, and shit got crazy. So. He performed his first uh, war execution in December of 41 on 
Carol Richter. Uh, and Carol is a guy. It's just K-A-R-E-L. Got it. He's being executed for being a sissy man with the sissy name. Whoa. <laughs> I was like, Carol, wow, what a bitch. So, sounds, like a, <laughs> sounds like a German name. Uh, I think he was actually born Czech and then immigrated to Germany or something. Either which way, he had a haircut that was short in the back and long in the front. You know what I'm saying? Fuck yeah. Dude, how right is Sean tonight? What is happening? You're on, dude. You are I'm on. with it, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> He's, He's the perfect amount of elevated. This is true. Yep. This is true. Maintained. Uh, so uh, I, I looked up Carol just to see kind of what he was guilty of, and it was like espionage or some shit. Uh, but he basically, he parachuted in near London in obviously 40 or four, uh, earlier that year, so it was 41, and um, he was quickly caught by some guy asking him for directions like a fucking clown. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, like the shortest version of the story is that Carol's coming in for some reason. God, now it sounds like I'm talking about fucking Carol Baskins at the goddamn Tiger King. <laughs> Carol <laughs> Baskins is it's coming in She past. killed her husband. And she's she's asking directions <laughs> towards the nearest tiger sanctuary. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. So, hey, Richter. Carol, it's a voice from your past. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm just going to say Richter. So, R- Richter parachuted in north of London somewhere, but like not that far. And um, some uh, truck driver goes by and he goes, hey, mate, where's this Hamlet? Where's this whatever? And the guy was like, or Richard was like, uh, I don't really know. And he had like a deep foreign Eastern European accent. Yeah. And he was like, hmm, okay. So the truck driver drove to the nearest town, told the sheriff. The sheriff went back to where Richard was still standing in the fucking road, picked him up, and then he got hung. That was it. That's it. Wow. wow. You're the worst fucking spy. Way to go, Carol. You're a terrible Ever. spy. You're a really horrible Come spy. Come on, Carol. She was waiting for the manager. She was waiting for the manager. There are a ton of stories of uh, kind of failed espionage uh, exposés like that, where they yeah. went over and they were just like instantly nabbed, or just like stupid enough to believe in whatever the hell they were doing. What's surprising about this is obviously where Albert comes in, which is there's a trial, they're guilty. All right, hang in time. So Albert entered the cell uh, on the on the day for Richard's execution. And he was supposed to, as lead, he binds the wrist and the assistant binds the ankles and legs Well, after they get out front. But as the lead, he goes in with the cell with the, I think they call them wardens. Um, well, he puts the leather strap on the wrists and Richter busts them, just jumps, boom, jumps. And like, it was like, oh shit, he's out. But there's like three dudes in the cell with this guy. So Richter runs at the stone wall head first and like hits it. What? Whoa. And they're like, what the fuck? Yeah, and so he's he's stunned, he's kind of stumbling, and they're like, dude, he hit that thing like three big strides, <laughs> and he whacked his face into the whole wall, like, what the fuck? Uh, so he jumps loose, runs into the wall. Albert managed to get the wrist straps on him again, after they kind of, after he's sort of stunned, they all kind of wrestling up again. Richter literally breaks the wrist strap, which has never happened before in, in Albert's career. He just hulked out. He just hulked out of them, and they fight with him for, like, a full, real ten minutes. They're like, this guy is like, where am I fucking going? And it's like, dude, you're a terrible spy, but you're real good at fighting, apparently. (laughs) This is why they sent you, man. You suck at spying, but you're good at fighting. This is cool. Yeah. So they're, um, they're, it was, uh, they brought in another guard, so it was like five, sorry, it was four wards, four guards, and, uh, and Albert, and they're wrestling in the cell, and they finally get him. So they get a new set of straps on him. Those seem to hold. They, they, I think they actually put the ankle straps on him then and kind of like waddle him out there or whatever. Yeah. He's kind of set to go. They put the hood on. They put the noose on. And for the record, the noose does go to the left of the jaw, left of the lower jaw, according to Mr. Albert. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. All right. So he puts it uh, kind of left lower. And that's important because they, he's all, you know, the assistant backs away. He's standing over the trap door. Right as Albert is pushing the lever, Richter jumps. Wow. Why a jump? Who knows? Obviously a moment of panic, and this person is unstable. Because he jumps, the trapdoor then goes away, so there's a free fall happening. So at its peak, though, the noose kind of comes loose and gets hung up under his nose. Ugh, ugh, mm. ugh. But it's still, it's stuck there. It's still Uh-oh. tight, and it's obviously a thick Uh-oh. rope. So then... The drop begins to happen. Uh-oh. And so 
beyond all luck, it stays, doesn't rip his nose off, and kills him instantly. Well, wow. 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 It, it worked out, but, like, like they, like, everyone kind of saw it happen, and were like, oh, but the trapdoor is gone. Like, it's happening. They can't put it back up. Yeah. So he, he drops through, snap, and he's gone, and they're like, oh, shit. It worked? Oh, my God. That's the worst case of following your nose to adventure. <laughs> worst. Sean's on fire. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Beautiful. You, that was beautiful. I, I think I think the takeaway from this is never follow your nose when it comes to hand. Never no, follow your nose true. when it comes to nope. execution. Yeah. That's not an adventure. If you're about to be executed, never follow your nose. Very bland and mathematical. Lots of angles. Lots of dangles. Uh, there's <laughs> lots of dangles. The thing is, there's so many dangles. There's so many oh, dangles. God. Mm-hmm. You get sick of them, really. Yeah. But so the, the, the medical examiner said, you know what? I don't know how it happened, but still a clean kill. He was dead right away. It worked. And Albert said in uh, his biography that he later released in the 70s that it was hands down the most complicated, crazy execution that ever happened. And it was his first one of a war criminal. Wow. Which is nuts. That is nuts. Yeah. Oh, which also, uh, so war criminal meaning he probably probably came from Germany. So it it occurred to me Cer- certainly Nazi Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, his his name might have been Richter. Well, so it's spelled um, R I C H T C H T E R. And now I'm saying Richter because I actually I knew some, I I didn't know somebody. I met somebody with that same last name. I said Richter. They said it was incorrect, and it was Richter. That's why I'm saying it. If it's wrong, I don't know. Please correct me. Please, German listeners of the Lesser Known People podcast, hit us up, throw us a twat, or, uh, you know, message <laughs> us uh, somewhere. Come to our website, lesserknownpeoplepodcast.com, and just, you know, have a good time. Yeah, find us find us on the social media. Find us on the social media platforms. Yeah. Uh, and the last note about that kind of, I'm not going to say botched execution because it wasn't botched, um, is that he still had the leather strap through his entire career. He kept it in his pocket as a reminder of, like, she can get wild. She, she can, can get wild. Stay frosty. Ooh. Absolutely. So um, there isn't no no offense to anybody that um, that Albert was in charge of hanging up, but because there are so many quote unquote bodies on his jacket, th- there's really no point in going through all the different people he he did hang in, during the war because there are so many. Uh, it's just tons and tons. So uh, during the war, Albert traveled around Europe. Uh, it was to Hamlin, which is in German. It's somewhere. I don't know where it is. Anyway, <laughs> so he traveled He traveled around the UK, uh, and he traveled to different parts of Europe to perform hangings based on, based, you know, for the UK in service of the crown. So for maybe, maybe first international hangman. Yeah. Potentially. Like, yeah, potentially, really. I don't know. Actually, they didn't say it. That's a good, that's a really good point. This is why we have the podcast, people. This is a great point. <laughs> we're going to get it into Guinness. We're just going to call Guinness and let him know. Like, hey, hey, here's this guy. Please do this. I mean, he may he may have the highest body count that, that they can confirm. And Guinness, please follow us on every social media platform. <laughs> Give us listen some Listen to us on anywhere you listen to podcasts and find us on our website. We would do Thank great. We'll, fo- we'll follow you back. We'll follow you back. Definitely, Guinness. We'll follow you back. Uh, so yeah, so he was, uh, he was traveling around doing that, uh, for basically the majority of the forties. And at the same time, he was still doing civilian hangings as well, which is why that, that count just creeps up and creeps up. I mean, that decade was just full of death. So everyone from German spies, British spies, and actually American servicemen who were found guilty of capital crimes in England, he was responsible for hanging. And sense. at the time, I did read a note. At the time, there were some things that were considered capital crimes that aren't anymore. I think like rape and a few other things. I'm not saying anybody should get off the hook, but they're no longer considered hangings. So, oh, wow. He he, he wow. got in that golden era of we kill everybody <laughs> kind of English shit. Jeez. <laughs> so, so Mr. Albert was, he was responsible for for. Basically everybody. He he was. I know there were other. I said earlier there were other executioners working at the time, and there were. I do think that for World War II, he was one of the go-to guys for being a lead executioner. So this this is a crazy stat. Between December 1948 and October 1949, he executed 226 people. Uh, 48 and 49. Less than a year. That's ten months. 
that's damn near hanging a day. Yeah. I mean, it's that's a it's full bananas. that's a full calendar. Like you're hanging people on yeah. Christmas, yeah. Thanksgiving, <laughs> Fourth of July. His day his day is just waking up, hanging, going back drop. to sleep. That's drop. all I do. Yeah, yeah. Drop, 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 drop. And that's what people in the crowd were saying. Drop. Drop, 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 dangle, drop. dangle, dangle, <laughs> dangle, dangle. And as he's dropped from the rafters, as he's dropped from the rafters into the ring. <laughs> this was before you had, you know, like music concerts and everyone was like, drop the bass. Back then it was like, drop the dangle. Yeah, drop the dangle. <laughs> That's what they and that's what they called the accused, the dangle. That's true. Drop the dango. Oh my god, drop the dango. Give him the dango. Give, Give him, him the, the dango. dango. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope not. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um th- and this is crazy too. So he he would often so because he was traveling, I mean, and to to Justin's point, right? That's like a hanging a day, except he was going home. He was he had time off. So he would show up over, say, like a 10-day period. He would go somewhere and hang groups of 17 people, 18 people in a day. Just I'm, on a, I'm, on a bang, hanging, bang. I'm on a hanging world tour. That's what Megadeth's first tour was called, the hanging world tour. Yeah. <laughs> God, his name would be Megadeth. It would yeah. be oh Megadeth. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he was, he, was, he was working a lot. He was working a lot. And he did, he did still hang a... Uh, I would say a regular number of people in the UK, <laughs> just citizens, which is insane. Oh I mean, God. it's bad. It's this so is bad. This is horrible. I know. That's why I said, like, when it's dark, it's super dark. Cause it's like 226 dude. people. That's nothing to fucking. Yeah. I mean, God. wow. Nothing to see is that. But let's just say, long story short, Albert's working a lot during this time and he's making some decent scratch. So he has taken ownership of a bar called Help the Poor Struggler in. Oldham? 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 That's quite the name. Quite the name. Help the poor struggler. Yeah. It also makes me think, come on, man. You're hanging people fucking yeah. every day. Help the poor struggler. You're making people struggle. You're making people dangle. <laughs> That's a, it's, a com- it's a complicated <laughs> name. Almost as complicated as the Lesser Known People podcast. Hey, LKP rolls off the tongue. It does. The shortened version's very good. It's got a ring. It's got a- But you guys can let us know by finding us on social media. Anywhere, and also finding us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Lesserknowpeople.com. Sorry, I was taking a <laughs> uh, that one, I rushed it, so it burned me on the way down. Um, yeah, so Albert's got this bar on the side. Now, it, it, I'm sure it wasn't during his peak days. He was necessarily at the bar every day, but he he was there. So he, it was sort of his like retirement plan, right? Like He wanted to be able to do something on the side. He could leave it and just pay people to work, and then he could go do executions and come back. It's interesting that he owns the bar because what happens next? One of his regular customers was named James Corbett, which is not James Corbin, that fat British singing guy who jumps around. James Corbett. So he was actually really good friends with James Corbett. Uh, they had fun nickna- nicknames for each other, which I think were Tish and Tosh. I don't know who was who or why the hell it was Tish and Tosh. That's but weird. It was. We love them. Sure. Tish and yeah. Tosh. They're super act over here. Tish, Tish.0 is really totally. good. Really funny show. Tish.0. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one that carried through. That's what, you know, it held the day. It held mm. the day. Um, and they often sang duets at the bar. I think I think Corbett played piano, or or one of them played piano, and they they would sing and kind of entertain the bar. Honestly, probably be jackasses the whole time, but just get ripped. Do they do they couple? Do they uh, do they get down? Do they touch the meat? Do they, roll the do they touch the meat? So this is Burton Ernie territory is Ooh. what we're talking about. So I will say they did not measure the angle of the dangle, but Albert had to measure the rope of his friend. No, oh. whoa. whoa. One day, Corbett is at the bar, like he normally is. He gets fucking blind drunk with Albert. And he, he was, like, divorced from his wife at the time, complicated, like, home life or whatever. But he goes to a hotel to go hook up with his girlfriend. They said mistress, but it was his girlfriend because he was separated from his wife. He goes to hang out with his girlfriend, and he ends up beating his girlfriend to death. Damn. He... Never denies killing her. He said that he did so under duress, kind of pleads insanity, doesn't doesn't go well, gets found guilty, and Albert has to hang Corbett. So real deal Sid and Nancy scenario with these yes. two lovebirds. Wow. Yes. So he did touch his meat. He did measure the angle of his dangle. Ah, but it was 
in the most professional and horrific sense. What songs were these guys singing? Because suicide is painless. <laughs> it brings on many changes. And I... I'll just... I'll just <laughs> that's a bad joke. You put, I was, no, that, that, no, was a great that, joke. I, was love it. I think we're all just enjoying the singing. I do love... Every time Ryan sings, it brings us to a halt. And I really love that. It, that's what it is. That's what it's, a, it's arresting. Um, it's beautiful. I, I would say K- KY is one of my best friends. I've known you my entire life. Um, I, back to the Halloween episode, I do believe that uh, we are all going to have to hang you one day. So, <laughs> wow. All of us? I don't deny it. I don't <laughs> deny it. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, this man is, is, uh, his memoir reads as, as something incredibly heavy here. I, did you, I don't know if you dabbled in this too much or, or how did you, okay. I did. So he had, um, I'll say now the, the source for this is primarily Wikipedia. And I, I typically would go down more source rabbit holes just to make sure, but a ton of it was pulled from his, from, uh, Parapoint's book, Albert's book he released in, I think originally in 74. And it just says the title of the book is executioner, uh, Pierre point. I wow. said Parapoint. I'm sorry about that. It's Pierre point. So executioner Pierre point, and it's written by him. I'm sure he goes right or whatever, but so it's, it's pretty well a tell all of how we got into it, a bunch of the executions. There is, there's a, lo- there's a laundry list of famous, uh, UK, basically murderers or, or criminals, uh, gangsters that he did end up hanging. I didn't want to get into all of those individually because quite honestly, it would take too much time. I mean, he has an incredible roster of people that he handled. And just to just to foreshadow, he's saving them for next KY episode, which will be four and a half days long. <laughs> yeah, it'll be long. It'll be really, really long. I'm going to take the full New Year's break and for, just do an New episode. Year's break, yeah, we will be recording nonstop through New yeah. Year's. Release the jelly tapes. Release the jelly, the jelly tapes. Ta- the jelly tapes are going to be very long and very sincere. A lot of death yeah. on those tapes. A lot of it's death gonna on be, those tapes. It's going to be just me, and it's going to be telling grim death of everybody. Just reading and, off time of death and date. Yes. Yeah. God. <laughs> oh it's going to be a New Year's marathon. Would that, be? That'd be, that would be so horrific to be like, oh, the lesser known people, they're kind of funny guys, and it's like, Oh, it's one of these jelly tapes, though. It's just... <laughs> it's just <jelly> tape. <laughs> so, we've, we, we've basically talked about Albert pre- and post-war, um, and it, it basically, he, he was prolific. He was re- really, really well-respected in, in the community, if that's what you want to call it, in the profession, certainly. Um, he retired in 1956. Technically, he retired over a reported payment dispute uh which basically he he went to go to a job to a hanging and uh it got canceled and there was heavy snow or something he expected to be paid for it it, it kind of was like bullshit but really i, th- I think he kind of <laughs> aged out and he was just done because the circumstances are ridiculous he and little league umpires are doing the same thing of well i <laughs> yeah. showed up you gotta pay me now come on i got my body here where's my fucking paycheck I, I can't do anything else today. I can't do anything else. You better fucking pay me. You want to talk about somebody you don't want to piss off, though. Holy shit. You get that man pissed off near a rope, you better watch your ass. I'm already doing the weights for you, asshole. <laughs> what are you, about 165? Yeah, you're done, dude. You're, you're done. done. Uh, yeah, you're imagine done. getting in an argument with someone, and they just like, hold the fuck on, bud. Hold the fuck on. And then he goes, <laughs> and he builds a gallows. <laughs> He's just on the phone with his boss, like, I'm breaking necks, I'm cashing checks. If I'm not cashing checks, guess where I'm at? I'm at your house, breaking necks, goddammit! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so good. Yeah. Al Pacino at his finest. Yeah. Exactly. Dude, he did though. Apparently, he did get into a, a pretty big argument with whoever that governing body is of fucking hangman's assholes, and he was just like, "Fuck you, pay me." And they were like, "No, you don't get paid." And he was like, "All right, piss on this. I'm gonna go to my fucking bar and do whatever I want anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm done." And he, he, yeah, he he was from uh, 41 to 56. Uh, during that time, he executed. N- Basically, all of the UK's most heinous criminals, and you can find that list literally anywhere. It just executed the UK at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, really. He, um, 
he did he did his job well. He did it with respect. And his, so very interestingly, though, his views on capital punishment have sort of waxed and waned over the years. Initially, he kind of said, listen, if this is supposed to be a deterrent, I'm a, I'm a living deterrent. I've hung hundreds of people, and I, there are still plenty of people to hang. Every time I drop from the rafters. <laughs> yeah, every time I come down, Bret Hart. Rope breaks. Sorry, that's a bad joke. No, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. It's fine. That was a good one. You should just roll with it. You should just roll with that one. It's a bad one. You, you talking about? You talking about Bret Hart's suicide? No, is it? He the, isn't he the one who fell from the from the rafters? One of the Hart brothers fell. Sting fell from the rafters. I no, it's I think Sting is still alive. I think. Yeah, Sting is still alive. Is it? Wasn't it Bret Hart who died from the? Rafters? I think. It, I think you're right. I think it was Bret Hart. That's. that's He's why still I was alive, laughing. isn't he? No. I thought he, well, either he's alive or he killed himself. That's a, kind of, or maybe it's Chris just Benoit. Give me, give me one second here. Give me one second here. Chris, Chris Benoit held himself up in his house, and then he killed his family and then killed himself. Jeez. Wow. That's, woof, woof. And I just want our listeners to know, this is our Christmas episode. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays. And, and just, no, Bret, Bret Hart is still alive. Bret Hart is still alive. Oh, he is okay. still, who fell from the rafters? Owen Hart. Owen Hart. Owen Hart. He fell Owen 80 Hart. From, the feet from the rafters in the middle of a pay-per-view event. Oh, Jesus. Oh pa- middle God. of the event, Damn. and they continued. Yeah. They continued, yeah, because they, they, they took him off, and then they Give just... Give him off the stage. Right? Give him off the stage. No one needs to see this, and the show keeps going. All right, everybody's happy. Yay. That's right. This is fine. You can this just see fine. Vince McMahon like, no, there's money still here. There's money here. There's money here. There's money here. Just leave him. Just leave him. Just leave him. Yeah. <laughs> let's jump. Let's jump back to Albert. Let's jump back to our hero, Mr. We Albert. will circle back. We'll we will circle back. So, um, yeah. So basically, so he went from it doesn't work to then later in life, which I actually think is like full. I don't want to old person, but later in life, they kind of interviewed him with like, hey, you're a prolific hanger executioner what do you think about all the crime these days and he goes there's too much crime you guys should bring back the death penalty in the uk because you guys you gotta start killing these motherfuckers because there's too many people committing crimes uh so he he did kind of wax and wane a little bit on it but he kind of stood as the human testament to um i would say to capital punishment in general but he did it with he did it with a plum wow he was a professional yeah so albert Pierre Point. Albert Pierre Point. I mean, Albert Albert Pierre Point doesn't really scream terror into my heart. And no. I imagine it was probably the same for a lot of like the. But heavy... learning his learning his life screams terror into my heart. <laughs> it does now, but I just imagine like the like the heavy duty criminal from the day. Like I killed forty seven women and seven babies. Yeah, and, and he's like, well, "Who's gonna kill me?" Like, Albert Pierre Point. He's scheduled for this week. Albert. P- yeah, exactly. Albert Pierre Point. Albert Pierre Point sounds like a, a a freaking orthodontist, not an executioner. To me, Albert Pierre Point sounds like a grocer, which is exactly what he was. Yeah. You know what I mean? He he yeah. he was like God, the guy, and God then he was damn like, it, that oh. was deep. That was fucking deep. That was, fucking, <laughs> good. That was fucking good. He, well, so so he died in ninety two at the age of eighty seven. So he lived a long, holy and shit, fruitful life. He he was married. Um, which the only side note there is he didn't tell her what he was doing kind of on the side, except he married her in the in the mid 40s. And he was like, oh, yeah, I have to go um, traveling for a bit. I'll be back. Desk work. Traveling desk work. To keep that locked up for that long. Holy well, shit. Well, so he didn't say anything to her. And this is like this one, like one of those. It's like it would be romantic if it wasn't so fucking grim. Is right. that he, he kept it from her. He comes back from a trip. And he goes, listen, I want to be honest with you. Um, I did, I I am like, I'm a hangman. I'm I'm a lead executioner here in the UK. And she was like, yeah, I know. The moment I said I was dating you, everyone was like, you know, that guy fucking kills people, right? (laughs) (laughs) Our buddy Albert. What a, what a, what a, oof, my gosh. And if you want to hear more stories like this, check us out at lesserknownpeople.com. Hit us up on our social medias. We got Twitter which we definitely have active all the time, constantly. We have Instagram. We got Facebook. Definitely Facebook. We're super active on Facebook. Hit us up anywhere. Google us. Check out our fucking episodes. We will have something that you're going to like. Guaranteed. And if you have an idea for a story, hit us up. Let us know. We will do it. We'll give you a shout out when we do it. And with that, good night. We love you guys. We'll see you next time.